When I was at Cambridge, um, it was a period just after they developed a number of propositions which undermined conventional economics, but which, like conventional economics, were couched in terms of very strict equilibrium conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, in fact, that the uh, inspiration for some of their exposition was uh, from thermodynamics, where you have an equilibrium, and then if you want to talk about change, you yeah. talk about changing very, very slowly. Um, one of the things I was able to show while I was a, a student there was that uh, that that couldn't happen. That uh, any kind of change would be would lead to unpredictable results, and that led uh, in the end to my uh, PhD thesis, in which I had a description of macroeconomic processes, which themselves led to what we would now call complexity. As I said, I described the kinds of interactions and the reasons for those interactions which lead to uh, uh, extreme sensitivity to prevailing conditions and uh, upturns and downturns in the trade cycle. Um, I, I certainly hadn't thought of uh, anything like uh, leptocratotic distributions of absolute first differences, but uh, uh, what I described in my thesis, and this was uh, 1972 three I wrote it, um, is what is now recognizably uh, complexity. And I then was concerned that I, being as I was a trained economist, that I couldn't come up with a model which described the processes that I was uh, describing. Um, so, I then, uh, well really that, that, that's driven my whole career, uh, trying to do that. Um, and the, it was probably f 15 years later or so that I, uh, I came across some of the work by Herbert Simon. I uh, started looking at that, and I had just published, uh, uh, I had just published, no, I just got the royalties advance from uh, my second book, which described, which was an extension, a generalization of my PhD thesis, uh, and I still haven't been able to uh, model the process, uh, but I did use uh, mathematical analysis of the sort of accounting relationships which would give rise to the sort of volatility that we now associate with complexity. Uh, and with that, I bought a, uh, a BBC Model B computer um, with its 16, th no, with its 32 kilobytes of wow, uh, whole thing RAM. Um, I rapidly ran out of that, but in those days, you could buy a second processor. And I don't know if you remember, but it used to sit, in, it, was, it was contained in a keyboard. And the idea was that you would plug the keyboard into a television or whatever, but all the processing was in the keyboard. But you could get a, a, a second processor, which was about that wide, uh, and which had the same configuration. It was also the same ivory color, and it fit rather neatly. It was nicely ergonomic, you understand, uh, next to the keyboard. And that had 64 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, and so, and uh, there was also, at that time, uh, a very early form of structured BASIC. BBC basic, uh, and a program that would strip the line numbers, because it was all, it was like Fortran, you know, early Fortran line numbers. Uh, so you could actually write, you know, functions and procedures and things, and you didn't have to worry about the go-tos and all uh -huh. that. <laughs> um, and so I produced a, uh, uh, just to, to try it out, I uh, built uh, what we would now call an agent-based model. Uh, and being an economist, I called them agents. That wasn't uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that was good. I published that paper in several, uh, in, in two versions, because I took as a, uh, just as a test, I said, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a model where I know the analytical outcome, and I'll make sure that I've, so I'll know if I've got it right. Yeah. Well, I couldn't get the same result 
so it's a very well-known uh, uh, theorem, uh, which has given rise to this uh, whole literature in what's called evolutionary economics. And uh, I couldn't get the result. And then when I looked at it, uh, I saw why I couldn't get the result. And I discovered and that led me to the, uh, the, the man who wrote the, the theorem's uh, uh, justification for his way he specified the model and found that there was an error, a mathematical error. Uh, so I managed to publish in the world's leading uh, economics journal. In those days, the Quarterly Journal of Economics and uh, in another journal in a different form. So that was, that, was, that was quite good. And that sent me on the road to uh, agent-based modeling. So, I mean, now we use agent-based models all over the place all the time. They're, they're completely, maybe not completely actually, in certain disciplines it's certainly not the case. But um, doing agent-based modeling isn't a particularly edgy or controversial thing to do. But back in the day, I mean, what was it like trying to engage with economists who are, who are very um, happy with a certain approach a certain theoretical approach to you know, addressing a particular system, and you come along with your what seems to be a, a complicated, complex uh, mathematical computer code, which is might at certain times be telling them something quite different or at least challenging. Um, well, it meant I couldn't get a job in a, a decent uh, economics department. Um, I ended up in a business school in a university that was new, and uh, they were willing to have me because I published, uh, uh, maybe to set up a, uh, uh, a research center. Um, the, uh, and at about that time, I had a, uh, a young, uh, I was going to say postdoc, I don't think he had his PhD then, but a research officer uh, working for me, uh, who uh, said to me one day, why do you keep bothering with these economists? I said, well, I'm trying to you know, lead them on the road to Damascus. And he said, what makes you think they're ever going to listen to you? I said, well, you know, uh, yeah, experience shows that uh, they're not going to. So I gave it up then. I decided that there was no point in being an economist anymore. Um, and uh, at about that same time, the computational economists came along and thought they were doing something revolutionary. Uh, but they were using standard economic theory. Um, and it's true that economists have a problem with me in that uh, when I studied economics, there was a strong uh, basis in uh, the history of economics. I say I learned a lot about uh, uh, oh, you know, Adam Smith and David Ricardo and the, the early economists and how economics developed through the uh, 19th century. And I even had published papers in the history of economics uh, showing how the basically the way economists deal with the firm uh, started out from a very empirical basis. They were actually dealing with a serious problem of how you set the rates for freight on railways, uh, where a lot of the ideas came from, and how that became uh, increasingly divorced uh, from any kind of uh, empirical relationship. Um, so whenever they uh, said, ah, but you know, we have this concept I'd be able to say, ah, yes. But what it was invented for was that. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you've done is to change it in a way that it no longer bears any relationship to what we observe in the real world. And of course, I knew more about the history of it than they did, so that they, they would get very cross. Uh, and then, was that seen as a destructive activity? Oh, very. You're coming very. along and you're pulling out all the, the scaffolding, all the stops. And it became very personal. Really? Uh, people became very, very angry with me. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I remember at one stage, uh, a leading uh, proponent of uh, computational economics said, ah, but we, the reason we uh, uh, continue to use economic theory is so that we can talk to economists. I said, right. So physicists should talk to phlogiston theorists. You know, geneticists should talk to, the, to believers in the homunculus theory of uh, reproduction. And astronomers should keep talking to astrologers, right? And at that stage, um, uh, this was on an email discussion list, the Simsoc list, uh, the moderator said, I think we've had enough. <laughs> Do you think a, a few bridges might have been burned during that? Um... Oh, many. Many. Friendships were lost. Really? OK. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Which I regret. But, uh... So it, it's not just um, it's not a fundamental difference in uh, methodology. I mean, agent-based models allow you to do things that you know, 
traditional you know, um, equilibrium models can't. But there's also a fundamental issue with some of the uh, grounding assumptions for lots of these theorems or lots of the basis of economics. Yes. There are two broad approaches uh, to economics, well, maybe three if you include game theory. Uh, one is partial equilibrium, where you look at a particular industry, so-called. Uh, and then there's general equilibrium. And there are some well-established results in general equilibrium, which, in, which prove that if you allow, if you model trading at every date in a sequence of dates, that on the assumptions of general equilibrium, the computational capacity of every individual would have to be unlimited because the amount of information that is required to optimize in the way that they are assumed to optimize uh, would grow exponentially from uh, date to date. Um, and the, uh, well, that, 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 that's really enough. Uh, and in partial equilibrium, the results that uh, I was talking about from Cambridge uh, in the 60s uh, showed that the core uh, uh, concept of the what are called neoclassical growth models, um, which amongst others Gordon Brown relied on to argue for some of his policies, uh, require that there only be one commodity in the economy, uh, that that commodity plus labor can be used to produce more of that commodity. Um, but if anything else, if you, if you violate that, those assumptions in any way, for example, you can say that uh, I'm going to have a commodity that produces yeast. Yeast and people produce yeast. But if you needed a bowl or a spoon, uh, then the whole con uh, structure of uh, these models falls apart. Okay, you can't use it. The, the, we, we know formally that that's so. Um, and that, that's, that's difficult for people who have been uh, trained, you know, whose careers depend on using those concepts. Um, you know, in America you get seven years to get tenure. If you don't get tenure, you're out. Uh, well, you have to publish. And if you're going to publish, you, know, you need to publish in decent journals. And if you're going to publish in decent journals, you got to do what uh, economists do. I mean, I once had a, uh, I was once invited to submit a paper because I was known to be heterodox to, I'll tell you, it was the Journal of Industrial Economics. And I, I said, look, you're not going to publish my stuff. Economic journals don't publish my stuff unless I'm showing that you know, there's some specific uh, uh, proposition that's, that, that's formally incorrect. And uh, they said, no, 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 we'll publish this. Anyway, the, the review came, but the, the referee's report came back. I don't see what's wrong with assuming that everybody knows the correct model of the economy. This is not economics. And the editor said, on the basis of this review, I'm sorry, I can <laughs> accept your paper. Surprise. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it gets, um, um, I, mean, I didn't fall out with him over that, but. Uh. Okay, so <clears throat> what's the, put your mind into the mind of a classically trained economist who is at least happy producing theorems or working under the assumptions of partial general equilibrium. What are they thinking then? What is, is the justification, okay, we know it's, n it's, no, it's not true, but if you squint enough and maybe put enough correcting factors, it's a, it's a reasonable approximation. I mean, is that the justification for it? Or, is there, or does it elucidate to something more fundamental that's going on? Well, just this last Monday, on uh, the BBC Four start of the week, uh, I heard uh, just brief. I didn't hear the whole thing, uh, but it was a, the discussion was about mathematical models, and I think it was uh, uh, a result of the failure of uh, economic models to correct with any to forecast with any degree of accuracy the ex our, our current experience. Uh, and there was someone there who said it's not the models that are. Uh, is that they're being wrongly applied. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, you say models should have conditions of application. I do believe this, and it was certainly something I was taught uh, as a student. Um, so what are the conditions of application 
of uh, an economics model. Uh, so if you, you know, and, and if you ask an economist, well, what makes you think that this is good? He said, well, because um, uh, uh, it predicts well. You say, well, okay, what does it predict well against? Well, it predicts well against all this data I've got. Well, the way you predict with, and the way these models all work is that you, you develop the model on one set of data, and then you test it on another set of data. And then you find the model doesn't work, so you go back and you build it, rebuild it on the first set of data, and then you test it on the second set of data again. And you keep doing that until, though, your model conditioned on the first set of data accurately predicts the second set. This is per perfectly standard, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they believe it. And then uh, you say, oh, but it doesn't forecast post-publication data. And they say, ah, oh, yes. But that's because there's been a change, an exogenous change, which is outside my model. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you can't, so you say, well, okay, what are the conditions in which your model, you know, I could test your model against something that hasn't yet happened. Uh, and you would tell me, what, you know, and that would be a definitive test. What are the conditions of application of your model? Oh, but, but models are only tested by their predictions. We don't test them by their assumptions, for example. So the assumptions are not conditions of application, mm -hmm. only the predictions. And the predictions only fail because the conditions of application, but we don't know what those are, but they certainly include, they certainly exclude things that happened after uh, publication that they, they don't obtain. Okay, so the idea of that all models are wrong, that some are more useful than others, and in some disciplines, let's say computer science, where you're using a neural network to try and uh, teach it something about some underlying structure of the data. And there's a classic problem where if you use the same training uh, data, then you overfit. You, you, you can accurately reproduce the training data, but then when you ask it to generalize, it's completely hopeless because it's become frozen, it's become locked into the specifics of the training data. So in the first instance, just getting a model to accurately um, fit data doesn't give you a great deal of um, confidence. It's actually a very good model. It's very useful. So do, is there any uh, explicit appreciation of that, the idea that it's no good just you know, fitting curves to an elephant? It's no good of just you know, overfitting a model. There's, it's got to, presumably, it's got to tell you something about the processes or the mechanisms or be able to generalize in some way. Economic theory does not tell you about process. No economic theory tells you seriously about process. Apart from game theory, there's no economic theory that tells you about any process that involves social interaction and the influence of one agent, a person, on another. Right? Unless it goes through the market, some kind of stigma. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we know that that's actually very important in, uh, in social life. Um, Game theory does, and uh, that is about social interaction in a way, um, but it's not about process unless uh, there are only two, very rarely three players. Um, if there are more than that, then the properties of a game theoretic solution are determined by a fixed point theorem, uh, which only holds at a point of equilibrium. Uh, it says nothing about anything that's outside that. Uh, so even the game theoretic models don't tell you about process. Um, the, in macroeconomic modeling now, there is a tendency towards what are called uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Uh, but even in those, you just have usually two, sometimes three, maximum five uh, agents, where one will be all households, another will be all firms. A third might be the rest of the world. Right? Um, so that they uh, avoid the, the, any kind of uh, uh, social process. Um, even though they're, they're sort of simulating uh, a series of time steps. Uh, so in terms of process, no. There's nothing in economics, conventional economics, that would be at all useful. And that seems to be in stark contrast to an agent-based modeling approach in which you would begin with certain assumptions about mechanisms or processes and then seek to realize that in some way and then produce a simulation. 
Yes. Um, that is what agent-based modeling does. It introduces social interaction. And, and there is never, I think, any equilibrium in it. Mm -hmm. So what are the, are there fundamental limits to this approach? Are we currently just constrained by our computational power? Our, you know, we need to build bigger computers to produce more complicated or complex uh, agent-based models? Or are there maybe other kind of more theoretical limits to what an agent-based model can help us understand about economic or social systems? In my work, at least, uh, I use models to <clears throat> tell the stories of interested stakeholders. Um, and the, so that there's no, there's no theory underlying it at all. Uh, well, there's no, the, the model itself is not constrained by uh, theory. Uh, the behavior of my agents is informed by results from cognitive science and social psychology, which have been well validated in a variety of ways and in a wide range of contexts. Um, so the, the purpose of the model, and I hope this is getting at your interest here, is um, uh, not to tell us the truth and not to forecast, but is to um, enable us to tell uh, a story that a stakeholder wants to be told. Um, and the value of the models is that it imposes uh, precision and it doesn't allow ambiguity. So that, uh, for example, in, I was involved in one project where different people uh, were coming, almost coming to blows. Uh, and they're certainly screaming at each other uh, over how to measure vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I said, but, but, you know, vulnerability in a fishing village on the Bay of Bengal in Bangladesh is surely not the same thing as vulnerability in a nomadic community in the Sahel. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, but that depends on, you know, whether you use a, a spider web diagram or a... And they said, yes, but what's going to be on the axes? And they, they, they were really getting very angry. I said, I, I don't mind. <laughs> And my view is that you, you, you don't do that. You don't define vulnerability or sustainability or any of these other words that have almost no meaning, no agreed meaning. Um, you know, I would, for example, describe the, use my models to describe the conditions in that fishing village in Bangladesh. Um, I would, indeed I had a PhD student who did, uh, model uh, nomadic activity in the Sahel. Uh, and the consequences of drought or so on. Now, out of that, you could say, look, the results of these models show that they are vulnerable in the specific sense that if there is no rain for so many quarters, right, then their cattle are going to die and they're going to do it and then they're going to have to come to some arrangement with uh, the villagers. And, you know, there's, there's a process there that I can understand. And that's vulnerability of the nomads in the Sahel. That's not vulnerability in Bangladesh and I don't need to compare them. What is the reason for comparing them? Well, the reason for comparing them is to show that uh, uh, global climate change is going to increase vulnerability. Yeah, okay. And it's going to increase it in one way in the Sahel, it's going to increase it in another way in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. They're going to be different. Why do you have to compare apples and oranges? Presumably they want the same units and they can say, we've got 10 vulnerability units here, but there's only two there, so let's not worry about the and two. the reason for that is so that they can have numerically specified models. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability here is 42, and there is 38. And it's going to increase by 6%. Uh -huh. So do you see that um, as being one of the motivations for ideas like ecosystem services? The idea that you can begin to quantify what the natural world can do for us, and actually give it a unit, you can give it a dollar. and so. You know, that forest is giving us $10 or $1,000 per hectare, and this, this fisheries is giving us a, a certain amount here. I mean, the, the, the motivation is to try and get all these disparate different things into some kind of 
shared unit. So then you can begin to attribute, you know, maybe we'll allocate some resource here, or we won't really bother about that system over there. Well, in the end, you're going to have to, if you have a limited pot of money, say aid money, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to give it to the nomad or the fisherman. Yeah. And <coughs> having a model which produces spurious numbers is, it, it may make you feel better about it. You may say, well, it's not me. You know, the model tells me that I should give it to the nomad or I should give it to the fisherman. Um, but it is spurious. There's no clear or good, sound scientific basis for the model or therefore the decision. But why should there be? I mean, it's ultimately a political decision. And um, you know, you might say, well, you know, we, we can arrange to give um, money to the Sahel and the less the Norwegians to give it to the uh, the Bangladeshis or whatever. Or we're going to give it to um, um, you know people in Mali because we have a colonial, you know, past colonial relationship with them. So there are all kinds of reasons. But the model is not a good reason. Okay, so. I guess you'd have some sensitivity to the argument or the claim that a lot of science-based policy is just basically um, a, a political motivation which is being justified post hoc by maybe cherry-picking data or selecting the right kind of model that gives you the correct kind of output in, in terms of increases the credibility of the political decision? No, I, I think most people who do modeling, I can't say all, but uh, most of those who I, I, I've known well over the past nearly 50 years. Um, they're actually good scientists, uh, but they're good scientists doing bad science. They're good scientists in the sense that they're careful and they use the data that's to hand and they produce their models according to a well uh, understood and well defined uh, set of procedures for producing them and calculating the results and then they say, well, these are the results. Um, and you know, that's as good as a chemist putting together his appropriate chemicals in the standard way and making his notes, and, you know, lab notes, and you understand what's happened. Uh, the problem is, and the reason they're doing bad science is because they uh, accept the conventional uh, social theories. So what would your advice be to an economics undergraduate, maybe even at the University of Southampton, I think we do have some, would it be tear down the, the temple, burn your notebooks and go and do something else? Or would it be um, broaden your horizons, um, get involved in computational modeling? Would you, what would you say to a, what would you say to a first year undergraduate economics student? Well, first I have to tell you that I once did have a lectureship in economics at Southampton. <laughs> In, uh, okay, be careful what you say. Right? In uh, uh, the early 1970s, I left in uh, 75 or 76, um, and uh, I was told that uh, I could stay if I wanted, uh, provided I became an accountant. Okay. But they didn't want me teaching their economic students anymore. <laughs> what, was that because the content of your lectures was similar to I what was, we've just been discussing? Yes. I can imagine that doesn't get down very well in faculty. Um, okay, so you're not allowed to teach them anymore, but somebody might watch uh, an interview of you. Yep. What would you say to them? I would say that economics is, n is not an, a subject that ought to be taught uh, to undergraduates or possibly anybody else. Um, I mean, it, 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 it really is appalling. I, I think if you, if you had students who were sufficiently mature that they could uh, independently evaluate the goodness of what they do, uh, then uh, it might be okay. But you see, what, what happens is, the way, the way you teach it is, uh, for example, you will tell them about utility theory. Now, utility theory says that you have preferences. Um, this is a function with a positive first and a negative second derivative, uh, and it has a number of uh, properties. Uh, now, we're going to make some assumptions, uh, but we will drop these later. Right? Two of the assumptions are that uh, you have uh, perfect foresight. You, you know with certainty what's going to happen for the rest of uh, uh, history. Uh, and you have perfect knowledge. You also, there's nothing in the environment that you need to know that you don't know. 
Uh, you say, but we're going to uh, drop those assumptions later, uh, next year. So the second year, you see, they've, they've done all this work, and they've learned it, and uh, if they're any good, they've, they've, they've got a 2-1 or a 1st in their Part 1 exams. Uh, and then you say, okay, now we're going to begin to relax the assumptions. We're going to suppose, not that you know what's going to happen, but you can assign a probability to what's going to happen. What you don't tell them is you're assigning a probability to every possible event that might occur. Right? and that you know every possible event that might occur. You just only know the probability of its occurrence, but you know the full set. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we call risk. Uncertainty we'll deal with later, uh, but they never do. Uncertainty is where there are events that might happen, but you have no idea what they are. And since you don't know what they are, you cannot assign a probability to them. They're the unknown unknowns. Right. And, so, and if that's the case, you see, then the probabilities don't add up to one, in which case they're not probabilities, or at least probability theory no longer holds. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, it's, it's easy to get sucked in. If you're 18 or 17, you know, you, you, may, you may be done A-levels, which has a bit of this stuff. Um, it's, it's, it, it's not fair, really. Uh, and then by the time they uh, get on, they decide they want to do a PhD. Of course, they have every incentive to stick with uh, what they've been taught. Okay, we unfortunately have to finish soon because uh, the, your talk is about to start in a minute. What, um, what do you think e economics is going to look like in 50 years or 100 years? Are we still going to be laboring under what you would argue quite strongly are just fundamentally misguided assumptions? Or do you see some kind of change, progressive or maybe even kind of transition in, in thinking? Well, I might easily have been asked that question 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had been asked that question 50 years ago, what will happen in 50 years? Do economics will look essentially different? If I said then, no, I don't think it will look essentially different, that would have been my second ever correct scientific forecast. Uh, in another 50 years? It's hard to know. I think what is a real problem and what's is an impediment to a useful development of economics is that the economists are largely in control of the research funding for economics. And I will tell you, I was I, I gave a, a, a paper where I didn't uh, spatiate on these criticisms in quite the way I'm here, but it was clearly uh, a subtext. And I was approached by uh, an official of the ESRC Social Research Council, who said, we really need to get your inputs into uh, the way we, uh, we work. So I said, okay, I would be delighted to be involved in that, but I would be very surprised if it happened. And I said, no, 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 it will. Here's my card. Uh, well, that, I think, happened in about uh, September of whatever year it was. Uh, in New Year, I sent him a New Year's email saying, I guess there are no surprises here. Um, but it has to be said that the EPSRC is funding whatever looks like interesting social science now. Um, and it may be that this will have some impact, you know, that the economists will carry on doing what they do, but they will become increasingly marginalized. That is a possibility. So you see more opportunity for computational agent-based approaches? Yeah, but uh, it, it won't happen within the mainstream uh, economics community. As soon as anyone starts doing that, they will be outside the community. Right. At present, the leading, probably the number, what economists would reckon as the number one journal in the field, the journal Econometrica, will not publish anything computational unless it's an econometric computation. Um, and uh, uh, they will not publish any computational approach to theoretical propositions. N never mind agent-based. If it's just if it's computational, they will not have it. Um, so 50 years? Maybe. But I, I doubt it. I think, the, I think what, what will happen is that economics will become increasingly marginal different sort of social science, and I think we're seeing that emerge um, probably more in Europe than uh, North America.
America. And this would be a, a fundamentally multidisciplinary kind of social science? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's nice to think that something like that may happen. Well, uh, I think one of the most uh, uh, successful uh, EU initiatives, I think, is the framework programs, which has brought together a wide variety of people from different uh, different national cultures um, and established you know, networks of friendship, and collaboration, and collegiality. And uh, I mean, I've been involved with them since the third framework program, which I guess goes back to about the mid-90s. Um, and what I saw then, uh, and I'm still seeing now, the seventh uh, is that people are, once you get used to um, accommodating uh, other perspectives, because there's different social perspectives, different cultural perspectives, it's not a big step to accommodating different intellectual standpoints as well. And I think that's, that has happened. And that uh, the development of agent-based modeling that's now being picked up by, for example, the EPSRC, uh, really uh, uh, was established on a European-wide basis uh, with European funding mm -hmm. uh, of European research projects. Okay. Uh, well, we have to uh, finish there, unfortunately. Um, although, that does remind me of Max Planck, who once said that science progresses one funeral at a time, so maybe we just need to keep <laughs> waiting and waiting for the new generation to come forward. But thank you very much again for your time, and it's very a pleasure welcome. to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you.